Hi, this is Jenny Meisel with the Marion Soil and Water Conservation District, and I will be talking to you about native and invasive plants. First, a little background on the Marion SWCD. We're a special district, like a fire district, so we're separate from Marion County government. We're not affiliated with them. Our mission is to protect, conserve, and improve the quality of soil and water in Marion County through planning, technical assistance, and education. And we do that through several different venues and programs. We are not a regulatory organization. We're simply a source of free information and advice to help landowners and individuals conserve soil and water resources on their properties or lands that they manage. Our funding comes from a small portion of property taxes from Marion County residents. Jumping right in to the native plants topic here, I start with a quote um, from Doug Talame, who wrote the book, Bringing Nature Home. And if you haven't read this book, I highly recommend it if you are interested in native plants and wildlife and other animals, particularly birds too. Uh, his quote is, by favoring native plants over aliens or non-native plants in the landscape, gardeners can do much to sustain the biodiversity that has been one of the country's richest assets. Native plants support and produce more insects than alien or non-native plants, and therefore more numbers and species of other animals. So basically what he's saying is that really all, all it comes down to is native plants. If you have the native plants, then you attract insects, which then attract other wildlife and species. So just a fun fact to, to kind of go along and support this, a clutch of black-capped chickadee nestlings needs more than 5,000 insects over 16 to 18 days um, while they're in the nest and until they can leave the nest and forage on their own. And if you do the math on that between those days, that's about 300 caterpillars or insects a day that the parents have to go out and get and bring back for all those hungry nestlings. So think about that when you're um, choosing what plants to put in your yard and thinking about um, native versus ornamental or things like that. Think about those chickadees. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about what is a native plant or what is native. And generally, those are plants that are found to occur in our area before European settlement and usually within a particular ecoregion. And those ecoregions are areas that have similar ecosystems and the same sort of resources within them. So essentially, we are in the Willamette Valley ecoregion and are bounded by the Coast and Klamath and Cascade ranges, which are also separate ecoregions. A little bit about the benefits of native plants. They help provide clean, cool water that's important to salmon and other native aquatic species that live in our area. Those plants can help filter out pollution and contaminants and provide shade for the water. It also helps provide wildlife and pollinator habitat. I added the pollinator piece in there because they are also equally as important as wildlife. Um, and they provide this uh, food and help support those native species. It's also important, they're also important for erosion control. Um, the native plants usually have deeper and more substantial root masses than a lot of our invasive plants, so that helps to control erosion along streams. And then native plants are pretty resilient. They're adapted to our climate and different pests and diseases that are in our area. And if you kind of think about um, the plants in our area have to survive some pretty extreme weather conditions with extremely wet and saturated soils in the winter and hot and very dry to, uh, with little to no moisture in the summer months. So just having, you know, that balance and be able to, being able to um, withstand those differences is pretty amazing. A little bit more about the benefits of native plants. Um, a lot of times they require less care and maintenance because they are adapted to our local conditions. Um, they have evolved without the use of a lot of supplemental water in the summertime and without the use of additional fertilizer or pesticides. And uh, ideally, the inputs will be minimal after establishment. So once those plants have been growing for you know, three to five years, you really shouldn't need to give them much in the way of water or nutrients. They can survive on their own. 
Um, usually we do recommend to water occasionally for the first two to three years in the summertime until plants are established. And don't also forget that native plants are very beautiful. And just a little bit um, kind of going back to that quote from Doug Talame about the importance of insects and why we need those insects. They, since they eat plants, they then provide access to the energy stored in plants for other things that eat them. 96% um, of the terrestrial or the land bird species in North America rely on insects to feed their young. So that's almost all of the bird species that we have around in our area need insects for feeding their young. The insects also return the nutrients that are tied up in dead plants and animals to the soil. So they are, those are our decomposers that do that work. They aerate and enrich the soil. So think about other decomposers and beetles and um, earthworms for that. And then they also provide food either directly or indirectly for most other animals. Again, this is from the book, Bringing Nature Home. So what do bees and insects need? Well, a lot of um, our bees are actually ground nesting bees. So small patches of bare ground are really helpful for our ground nesting bees. You can see in this picture, those red arrows point to little tiny holes in the ground, which were made by bees that excavate those and they lay their eggs in the ground. It's helpful to plant in blocks or clumps of the same species of plants in one area because then that helps to reduce the foraging effort and the distance that they have to go to find uh, more of that same plant. Uh, bees and insects can also lay their eggs in um, hollow sticks and twigs. So if you provide those materials for them, you can attract bees to your yard. Uh, be free of pesticides. Don't use pesticides around your house because those kill insects. And then also plant a variety of locally native plants that flower throughout the season, which is really important for um, different insects and bees that emerge at different times of the year. This is a great picture that I took on OSU campus several years ago, and it was this awesome little way to display um, nests for bees using all different sizes of wood and you can see some of the hollow sticks in there and then also they drilled holes into those into that wood of different diameters so then different species of insects use those holes and you can see that several of them are already kind of plugged and covered with mud so different insects have been using those to lay their eggs. And back to the comment about providing plants that bloom throughout the year, this handy table that is on the Marion SWCD website and included with your uh, resources in your, your resource packet or the downloads. Uh, this shows a variety of native plants and shows the time of year that they flower and the colors that their flowers are. Uh, this is one side of the page for flowering plants and then the other side of the page shows trees and shrubs that are also um, shows the timing for that. And we're going to move on to talk about some trees in the landscape. They provide uh, shade, they provide structure and nesting habitat, and they also provide protection and erosion control for the soil with their, um, with their root systems. We're just going to highlight a couple different species today, and the first one is big leaf maple. This one is really common in our area. It's deciduous, meaning it loses its leaves. It enjoys full sun to part shade and well-drained uh, soils. They can be wetter or it can handle drier soils, but it does require a lot of space because they're pretty big trees. They do get flowers. You can see in the picture um, kind of on the left, uh, clusters of flowers that bloom in spring and bees really are attracted to the flowers of big leaf maple. And the other cool thing about maple is that it tends to get a lot of moss on its bark. So the moss attracts insects, which then attract different birds to the maple trees. And it provides great nesting habitat also for squirrels and chipmunks and all different kinds of bird species. Cascara is not quite as well known as uh, big leaf maple or some of our other like conifers like Douglas fir 
or western red cedar, but it's pretty important. It gets flowers and berries that are used by birds, and um, it's a shorter growing, smaller stature tree. It only grows about 30 feet tall. Um, you would plant this in sun to full shade or part sun to full shade and moist, well-drained soils. And again, those berries are a source, food source for birds. Oregon white oak is another great tree that we have here in the Willamette Valley. It's not quite as common as big leaf maple and there's not as much oak habitats left as there used to be before settlement. Um, they like to grow in well-drained soil and have plenty of sun, so a lot of habitat has been lost for conversion or land use uh, conversion for different reasons. But over 150 species of wildlife have been documented using these oak trees. They're very slow growing um, and associated with some wildlife species that are declining in populations like the acorn woodpecker, the slender billed or white breasted nuthatch, and the western gray squirrels. And what's really cool about oak trees is that their broken limbs can provide habitat for birds um, like the white breasted nuthatch or chickadees that are cavity nesters who nest in holes. So um, that's why these species are associated with the oak trees. And just to kind of go on a little bit more about the importance of oaks and what's threatening their habitats. Again, I kind of mentioned agriculture and urban development is contributing to habitat loss. Um, invasive species are also threatening oak and prairie habitats. And we've changed different disturbance regimes. So we've reduced the amount of fire and flooding that happen in our native habitats. And that has led to the encroachment um, by woody vegetation and closed canopy. So the encroachment is mainly from Douglas fir that have been growing up um, in between and among oaks. And Douglas fir grows a lot faster than oaks, so it can shade out and crowd out the oaks um, and help you know, create that closed canopy where the oaks don't thrive because they don't get the sunshine and it also competes for nutrients and resources. So what can you do? to help protect oaks, well, protect, their, protect the existing oak communities by removing conifers around those oak trees and working to control invasive species. Um, definitely plant new oaks. We have a lot of really old growth oaks, but there's not a lot of new recruitment in areas. A lot of people tend to mow around their oaks or do some sort of vegetation control, so that prohibits new oaks from growing up in some of those areas. And also along with, you know, controlling invasive species, be sure to reestablish native plants around the oaks and help complete that, um, you know, the entire habitat instead of just the oak tree. And in some areas, oaks have grown in really densely and it's helpful to thin some of those oaks where the canopy is closed and allow them a little bit more room to turn into that beautiful, large spreading oak that um, is pretty iconic here in the Willamette Valley. And also um, enjoy your habitat and the wildlife that use it. So moving on to talk about shrubs in the landscape. They provide shelter for a lot of wildlife and bird species. They also can provide erosion control along streams and steep banks because of their um, dense root systems and deep root systems. They also provide habitat for wildlife and pollinators. Most of our shrubs are flowering and then they get berries. So it's great for pollinators and then wildlife that eat those berries. And it also provides, you know, some eye level interest in, in natural areas. Red and blue elderberry are two great examples of shrubs that grow here in the Willamette Valley. They grow in a little bit different habitats. Blue elderberry um, is, prefers full sun where red elderberry can tolerate some more shade. And red elderberry also likes a little bit wetter conditions where blue elderberry can handle drier conditions. They're pretty fast growing and attract a lot of different wildlife uh, that eat the berries and pollinators that feed on the nectar from them. And blue elderberry is edible to humans where red elderberry isn't 
always edible. I've heard it could be, can be edible, but it takes a lot of processing. So I generally just tell people to, to not eat it. Blue elderberries um, are better to eat anyway. Red flowering currant is another great shrub. It has these beautiful clusters of pink, light pink to dark pink flowers that bloom fairly early in the season, usually around March. And this coincides with the return of the migration of rufous hummingbirds. So I almost always, the first rufous hummingbirds that I see each year, I usually see them on my red flowering currant plants in my house. Uh, it also provides berries. So lots of different bird species enjoy the berries also. Western service berry is another berry producing plant that is also edible to humans. Uh, cedar waxwings like to eat the berries off of Western service berry, and they're also great for pollinators. These like sun to part shade and moist to well drained soils. Um, if you have a lot of deer or elk around your property, you may need to look out for the Western service berry. They like to eat the service berry. Um, but next. Next plant here is Blue Blossom. This one is more native to Southwest Oregon, but it does great in the Willamette Valley. I have one of these plants in my yard and when it blooms, it just buzzes with bee activity. There's so many bees that use this plant. It's pretty amazing. And the, the blue color is also pretty striking. There's not a lot of blue blooming native plants in our area. This plant needs dry, well-drained soils and plenty of sun. It doesn't like a lot of summer moisture. So this is one that does really well in my yard because I can plant it and kind of forget it and it thrives. It does grow quite large. So if you have a small lot, um, you'll need to be careful on where you put this and make sure that it has a lot of room to grow. Don't plant it really close to your house like I did because it's growing taller than my house and getting up into my eaves and um, we have to trim it back quite a bit. So kind of going back onto the comment um, about what deer deer like or that deer sort of like to eat Western service berry. Um, I had a request a few years ago from folks in the plan for your land class and they wanted a list of plants not preferred by deer. So I found a couple different publications that had some information on it, but there's always the caveat of if deer are hungry enough, they will eat almost anything. So you'll you'll notice that Western service berry is on this list. So I think it just depends on how hungry animals are and if you have a variety of other things that they could eat. Um, and just remember that deer and elk are browsers too. So the, they usually take a little bit of something and then kind of move along. Next up, we have ground covers and herbaceous plants in the landscape. So these are things that mostly are flowering plants and ferns. So they help to protect soil from compaction by rain. So they provide that cover um, over the soil. They provide hiding places for small creatures. They can also help prevent erosion. And those flowering plants are great for pollinators. I have several plants here that we'll go over, and these cards are also on the Marion SWCD website, so you can go back and look up all this information if you forget what's in here or don't want to necessarily take notes. But the first one we have here is common camas. These like wetter areas in the winter, like it can withstand uh, standing water, and then drier areas in the summertime. So they're really great in kind of some of our wet prairie areas and I have these growing in my front yard and they really enjoy it. They bloom really well. They're on an east facing um, aspect in my yard and they're bulbs. So they were really important foods for Native Americans that dug the bulbs. Meadow checker mallow is another prairie plant. Um, that likes wetter soils in the winter and can tolerate full sun. Um, this also does it okay in fairly dry conditions as well if you don't have a lot of, you know, standing water later into the season. 
but they produce these white to pale pink flowers on tall stalks. They can sometimes get up to six feet tall, which is nice to add some variety to your, your garden if you want some taller plants. Western geranium it gets these beautiful, fairly large, bright pink to purple flowers. Um, they only grow about one to two feet tall. It can handle full sun to part shade and moist to dry soils. I have it growing in my yard and it it's on a west west facing side of my yard and it's pretty dry soils there. Um, if you water them, they bloom a little bit longer throughout the season. If you don't water them, then they just bloom for a little while and that's all you get. But the longer you can water them, the longer they'll bloom. Oregon Sunshine likes dry, well-drained soils and full sun. So these are great for kind of a rock garden or a sunnier spot in your yard. They produce these beautiful yellow daisy-like flowers. And this picture doesn't do it a lot of justice, but the foliage is kind of a light gray, grayish green. So they add some, you know, kind of variety and color with the, with the different colored leaves to your garden. Self-heal can also tolerate moist to dry conditions. They do fine in dry soils and full sun, and they can even grow in mostly shady conditions too, so it's pretty adaptable. They don't grow very tall. They get these beautiful purple flowers that are great for pollinators. I always see a lot of bees on the self-heal in my yard. Fringe cup, this is one of the species that really prefers shade. It can tolerate um, wet to dry shade. Probably not wet all summer, but it can handle the wet of winter. I have this growing on the north side of my house and it happily uh, spreads to fill in the space where I have it planted. It doesn't spread aggressively, but it has kind of filled in the area and the bed that I have it growing in, but doesn't crowd out the other plants. And it gets these cute little white to pink flowers on tall stalks. It blooms fairly early in the season. And sword fern is the last plant that we're gonna talk about here today. I added this one simply because um, of that it provides really good ground cover and um, habitat for and cover for small animals or critters on the ground. It doesn't necessarily get showy flowers, but it's really adaptable. It, can handle really dry conditions and can prefers to be in shade, but it'll do okay if it gets part sun too. I wanted to add a little bit about climate resiliency and talk about plants and climate, uh, climate change a little bit and just acknowledge that climate changes may end up influencing the distribution of certain plant species in the future. We're still studying this and seeing what plants are moving where and how they're moving. I know there's different studies that have been done uh, recently, especially like um, that other folks are talking about. And also our weather patterns are changing too and are gonna be much more variable with greater extremes, which are gonna make it difficult for some plant species to handle those changes. And a great example of this is actually happening in the Saniam Canyon. Um, that we had been seeing probably over the past five years. We've been seeing a lot of Douglas fir trees dying in the Sandy M Canyon, and it's suspected that they are not able to handle the wetter winters and the flooding and then the extreme drought and heat in the summertime that we've been seeing. So that kind of goes with the next statement that plant species can differ in their tolerance of an ability to adapt to changing climate patterns. So Douglas fir is definitely one of those species that we're seeing struggling in some places. And another one we're seeing starting to struggle too is Western red cedar. It's been documented that several of those fully grown, established, mature trees are starting to die in the landscape. And it's probably because of drought. They're not used to um, the heat and the prolonged periods of dryness that we've been having the past few summers. So we're gonna need to be more strategic on where we're planting some of these species that seem to be not tolerating the heat or the drought. And maybe those are gonna end up 
needing to be planted more closer to streams and waterways where they can get uh, more water year round. And then we also need to think about those disturbances like drought and fire and insects outbreaks and how they are gonna contribute to the cause of vegetation changes. So, and then those also, those disturbances can cause um, an increase in invasive species, which can also alter the vegetation and compete for resources with those native plants. But there's still a lot to learn, and I know there's a lot of research going on, so this is kind of a stay tuned and pay attention to your yard and what's happening in your yard and just think about um, the impacts and really be cognizant of if you're planting native species, make sure that you're trying to think years ahead and what their resources might need in the years, in the coming years. So this is, that was my transition slide from native plants to invasive plants. So we're gonna start talking about some different terminology for weeds or invasive plants and all that fun stuff. So essentially a weed is any plant growing where you don't want it. So it could be any kind of plant. And if it's not in the right place, it's called a weed. Um, then we have non-native alien and exotic species. So that is a plant or a species that's been taken from its native habitat and put in a new environment outside of its normal or local range. So something that doesn't naturally or historically occur in an area. Then we have invasive species, which are generally the plants that don't have natural controls that serve to limit their populations in their native range. So a lot of our native species are controlled by weather patterns or climate or um, pathogens or diseases or insects that help to control them and keep them from getting out of control like some of our invasive species that spread all over. And then we have the category of noxious weeds. So they fit all of those other categories and then they've also been legally designated by a listing authority as a pest. So that listing authority could be the Oregon Department of Agriculture or a county weed control district or a soil and water conservation district or just somebody has said this plant is a noxious weed. And our noxious weeds can cause injury to agriculture and other horticultural crops, natural habitats and ecosystems, and humans or livestock. Some of the characteristics of noxious weeds and invasive plants, again, they lack those natural enemies to keep their populations in check. Um, they're almost always non-native plants. They grow really fast. They reproduce quickly and have effective means of dispersing their seeds long, long ways. Their seeds can last a really long time in the soil. Some um, thistle species, their seeds can last almost 100 years in the soil, which is just amazing to me. Our invasive plants have few habitat restrictions, so they can grow in sunny conditions, they can grow, grow in dry conditions, they can grow in shady conditions, so they, they don't have uh, habitat-specific conditions that they like to grow in. And they also can have the ability to form single-species stands, so Think about blackberries and how you can see big, huge mounds of blackberries and big stands of blackberries. And this plant here in the picture is called puncture vine, and it gets its name from these seeds. You can see this is the seed head right here, and there's individual seeds, and they have these very pointy spines, and they're like three-sided, and they have spines on the other side too. And these can pop your bike tires or pop your car tires, but that's also to their advantage because then they stick in your car and bike tires and get transported a long way, um, helping with their dispersal. Some of the impacts of noxious weeds, they can outcomplete, outcompete other plants for resources such as water, nutrients, and sunlight. Uh, they cost a lot to control. Uh, $125 million is spent a year in Oregon controlling invasive species. They can take over um, fish and wildlife habitat and uh, destroy that habitat. Some can be toxic to people and animals. 
they can increase erosion. This kind of all goes back to the, the root structure. A lot of our invasive plants don't have very deep roots, so they don't do a very good job of holding in the soil along streams. They can spread rapidly and they can um, decrease crop yields and decrease property values. So one thing that's really important is to help stop the spread of invasive species, and there's several ways to do that. Make sure when you're out and about, drive only on established roads or hike and walk only on established trails so you're not walking off trail and potentially collecting seeds um, in your shoes or on your, on your pants or on your clothing or on your pets. So, and then learn to identify what invasive weeds are, tell other people about them. And if you are hiking off trail or walking in weedy areas, please clean your shoes and boots and clothing after you've been in that area so you're not transporting it to your car or other places. And again, prevention is the first line of defense. So again, make sure you clean areas, uh, make sure you clean your tools, your boots. Um, if you're in an area that are infested, clean off your pets as well. Um, if you can do nothing else, you can prune and bag the flowers and seed heads if you can't control the plants right away, at least prevent it from going to seed. Again, learn to identify problem species. And then if you do see some invasive species, early control is really great to get on top of it before it becomes a problem. And continuing on that idea of control, there's generally four main methods that include mechanical, which is kind of mechanical or manual, physically removing the weeds. Cultural control involves uh, prohibiting weed growth in different areas through different means. Biological control is using a natural predator to control the plants. And then chemical is using herbicides. So please note that some chemicals can have restricted use around streams. And we always encourage people to read the label and use herbicides according to the label and always ask questions. Consult with an agronomist or your agronomy center or call the Oregon Department of Agriculture if you have questions about the use of different herbicides. This is a great slide showing the biological control on tansy ragwort. These caterpillars, the black and yellow caterpillars, are from the cinnabar moth, and they're a great biological control. You can see that they're eating the, eating the leaves and flowers off of the tansy ragwort. And there's another um, there's another biological control called a flea beetle that actually does better than the tansy or the, than the cinnabar moth for controlling tansy. So there's some great biological controls out there, even though you might see a lot of tansy in different fields, just know that there are some biological controls that are out there working on it as well. This leads us into a little bit um, to a term that's used a lot in um, agencies for dealing with invasive species called integrated pest management. And that's essentially using different methods and combining them to control invasive plants, such as like mechanical control and herbicides. And I'll talk about this a little bit on the next side, but uh, the next slide, but mechanical control and herbicide is a great way to control blackberries. So the idea there is that you would mow the blackberries down first and then use herbicides after um, you've cut them down. So you reduce the amount of herbicide that you're using and you're not spraying a huge back blackberry patch. You're just spraying on the ground and a small sprouts that are regrowing. And after you've done your control method, just make sure that you monitor the site and treat any regrowth or new populations, which could be required for several years to get an invasive population under control. And then once you think you have control of your site, then follow up by actively planting um, native species back into that habitat and make sure that you're always on the lookout for new sprouts that pop up and, and control them right away.
This here is a great weed control calendar. This is available in the resource packets for the plan for your land class. And this, I really like this because it helps you learn different timings and what timings for control methods are the most effective. So here, this is for blackberries and across the top, you can see it goes through the months of the year. Um, I cropped this off, it, goes, it does show the entire year, but I just blew it up to make it so you could read it. Um, and then here it goes down the side, it talks about mechanical control, manual or mechanical cultural options, different chemical control options, and then a combination of that mechanical and chemical that I mentioned in the previous slide. And then this shows you also the growth stage too. So from February through April, blackberries are growing and then May through June and into July is when they flower. And then it also shows when they set seed. So then it gives you the time of month and what to do to control um, eat different plants for those months. And this is a, um, a part of an OSU publication about managing blackberries in Western Oregon riparian areas. And essentially this is saying that the most effective treatment for blackberries is what I mentioned previously, is that you cut them down first in mid-summer, mid to late summer, allow them to regrow back to 12 to 18 inches, and then um, use herbicide in fall on that regrowth. And it's really important to use herbicides in fall on blackberries, because that's when they're starting to go dormant and they're pulling all the nutrients and resources down into their roots. And that will help pull that herbicide down into the roots and kill the plants as well. So going through a few different um, invasive species here and some identification, the first one is false brome. This currently is mainly found between Staten and Detroit Dam um, along the North Staniam and Little North Fork rivers. And it's also found kind of in an area around Lyons, kind of between Highway 22 and the Little North Fork, maybe between Lyons and um, Mill City up in that area and can grow in open sunny areas and also in the forest understory. And it is a grass and can be very difficult to control and distinguish but, or distinguish between other invasive plants. But there's a couple key characteristics. And the first one is down here in the middle, these drooping seed heads and stalks. So when you see it, when it has seeds on it, it looks like the seeds are almost too heavy. Uh, for the, the stalk, and so they kind of droop over and fall over. It also has this very bright uh, lime green color, as you can see kind of on the picture on the right there. Um, it really is kind of a different, brighter lime, yellowy green than some other grasses. It's also really hairy. The stems are really hairy at the base, and the leaves also have hairs on them. And then if it has if it has seed heads on it, um, another characteristic, if you really wanted to get into some of the botany of this, is if you look at the individual seeds, they're connected directly to this main stem here. And this black and white picture, just adjacent to that, you can see the seeds here have, have smaller stems that branch off of this main stem. So if it's branching with seed heads, it is not false brome. And if these seeds are connected directly to the main stem, then uh, that's a characteristic of false brome. But I would also look for the hairs um, to compare with other grasses. This is a picture of uh, what false brome can do to an area. This, everything that you can see here in this understory is false brome, save for there's a couple of uh, scotch broom in growing in here too. So the scotch broom is still able to survive, but there's not much else there in that understory once that false brome took over. Tansy ragwort, we talked about this a little bit um, previously when we were talking about the biological control, but tansy ragwort is toxic to cattle and horses. So this is something you definitely do not want in your pasture. It gets yellow daisy-like flowers um, usually we see it flowering more full force a little bit later in the year, so June through August. Um, I did see some flowering still into like December and January this year because it didn't get that cold. Um, it can grow two to four feet tall. 
Uh, right now, this time of year, all we're really going to see is what this looks like in the lower right hand corner. You can see those um, kind of frilly lobed leaves there, and that's kind of the rosette. So winter and spring is actually a really good time to control tansy ragwort because you can just attack these um, rosettes and you can use herbicide or dig them up. Once it really gets into full flowering, herbicides are not going to work. The plant can still go to seed if you, even if you hit it with herbicide. So um, once you get to that full flower, really the main way to stop it from spreading is to cut, the, cut those flowers and seed heads off, put them in a bag, and throw it in the trash, which I know is not very fun for a lot of people. Knotweeds are the next invasive plant we're going to talk about. These are one of the most invasive plants and most difficult to control in the Willamette Valley. It also grows um, along the coast. It blooms later in July through October. It can grow up to 12 feet tall. There's several different species of knotweed and they're all noxious weeds. It does have, I don't have a picture of it, but their stems look kind of like bamboo. They're hollow inside. And these leaves are kind of oval shaped to heart shaped and it gets these white flower clusters again kind of later in the year and it's usually found along streams but I've also it's been planted in people's yards. Um, it dies back every year. People sometimes really like to use it as a screen but um, it has a very strong root system and it spreads very rapidly and it, it can even come up through concrete. So it's a terrible plant. If you have this, um, I would definitely be um, trying to get rid of it. So if you need help, give us a call. Yellow flag iris is an aquatic invasive plant. It grows along waterways, usually along the edge of waterways. It blooms in late spring, early summer, bright yellow leaves um, or bright yellow flowers. And the leaves are really similar to ornamental like our bearded iris, which I have this picture of a bearded iris. So this is not yellow flag iris. Um, look down here in the lower right hand corner and you can see yellow flag iris kind of has three main petals and they're a bright lemony yellow color. And it really only grows along or in water and the seeds float, which helps it transport um, in the water to new locations. Garlic mustard is an invasive plant that we don't yet know of in Marion County. It's in several counties surrounding us. It's in Clackamas County and Yamhill County. I believe they might have some in Polk County too. It gets um, tiny white flowers on a stalk. It blooms fairly early in May through June. Can get about one to three feet tall. The leaves can be kind of dark green and scalloped um, along the edges. It is mainly found in shady areas and forest understories. This picture in the upper right, um, almost everything you see in the understory there is garlic mustard. It pulls fairly easily um, in the winter time, so a lot of hand pulling is done with this plant, but it is um, in the mustard family, so it gets those long skinny seed pods, and when they're ripe, they burst open and seeds shatter and spread everywhere. Um, and can be ejected quite far with this, these plants in the mustard family. So please be on the lookout for this. We don't want this in Marion County. They have terrible problems with it in the Portland metro area and some other places. It spreads very rapidly and takes over quickly. Shiny geranium is the next plant on our list. And there's another one. The next slide is also a geranium species. They're closely related. They both have red stems and little pink flowers. Shiny geranium is not hairy. It's an actually an annual plant, so it pulls up really easily, but it can take over areas and it spreads very quickly. And it doesn't even hardly need soil, um, as you can see in the picture on the left. It's growing in a, this is a drinking fountain, and it's growing in between the rocks. Herb Robert is that other geranium species. You can see again the pink the pink flowers and the red stems. Herb Robert, as opposed to shiny geranium, this Herb Robert is hairy. The stems are hairy and um, you can see here some of the little seed pods are also hairy. This again spreads really rapidly. The leaves are a little bit different. They're kind of more fern-like than the shiny geranium. 
but they both grow kind of in forest understory shady areas. It can spread very rapidly. The next one is water primrose. This is an aquatic invasive plant. It grows mostly in ponds or in kind of backwater sloughs and slow moving areas of rivers. We have an infestation of this along the North St. Anne River and in Lyons at John Neal County Park. There's also quite a bit of it at Minto Island Park in the city of Salem, although they're working to control some of those populations as well. Gets bright yellow flowers, doesn't bloom until later in the growing season, probably like July or August, and then it'll continue blooming until the first frost. It grows very rapidly and quickly and dies back every winter. So you only see this above ground mass in the spring and summertime, and then it's completely, you hardly see it at all in the winter time. It can form dense floating mats and make areas impassable for recreation and to um, like ducks and other animals that want to use the area. Lesser celandine is another bright yellow plant. This is probably blooming around this time of year. Um, it says March through April, but I had somebody email me the other day saying that their lesser celandine was starting to flower. Um, this spreads very rapidly. It has little bulblets on the roots. So if you try to pull this plant, these little bulbs will break free and can each one can start and spread a new plant. It has kind of glossy, shiny flowers and the leaves are kind of shiny and a little bit thicker um, and kind of kidney shaped. And it was introduced as an ornamental plant. So some people have this planted in beds in their yard and it can escape their garden beds and take over lawns very quickly it's difficult to control because of those bulblets. So if you're gonna try digging it up, I recommend removing all the soil from around the plant and throwing that in the garbage, bagging it, and don't compost it. Meadow knapweed, I believe, is the last invasive species that we have. We're getting down to the end here. This also forms dense stands. It can grow along roadsides. And we see it quite often along the North San Am River on gravel bars and um, along the side of the river. And it can also grow in pastures and forest openings, so it likes sunny areas. Gets these um, bright pink to purple flowers that are at least probably the size of a quarter, if not a little bit bigger. Um, the seed heads are pretty distinctive, as you can see here on the left side picture. They're these little round brown knobs. Um, that's what it looks like before the flowers open. And it can grow about one to five feet tall. And it spreads rapidly in different environments, especially in kind of pasture environments, and especially if it's mowed. Next, if you have invasive species on your property, you can report them to the Oregon Invasives Hotline. Um, there, an expert can help give you information on how to control them or can put you in touch with additional resources and information about the plant. Or if you find something that you're not sure what it is, you can take pictures and upload pictures and the experts will help you identify what your plant is. This can also be used for um, insects and other kinds of plants too. So there's all different kinds of resource experts on here. A couple additional resources to for invasive plant information is the Oregon Department of Agriculture, the Oregon Invasive Species Council, Marion County Weed Control District, and a source that I really like to use that has great information is actually in Washington State, uh, the King County Noxious Weed Control folks um, out of in the Seattle area have a great website and great um, information on identification and controlling a lot of different invasive species that are similar to what we have down here. Another great resource that I believe is in your resource packet for Plan for Your Land is the Oregon Garden Smart Guide. And this shows you um, different invasive species and tells you why they're invasive and then gives you alternatives that are native plants and ornamental plants that look similar. So I definitely like to use this and I give it out. We have some printed guides too. If you'd like one of those, just get in touch with us and we can mail one to you. But that is all I have today. If you have additional questions or concerns 
or need help with plant identification, don't hesitate to reach out to the Marion Soil and Water Conservation District. And thank you for watching this presentation.